Okay, I will be reading from The Universal One by Walter Russell and just one chapter near the very end, which is his concluding chapter. And as I read it, I'm going to have this going, showing all the light that I take pictures of that recently I've taken these pictures and uh, you might want to just study them as they go by. Now, conclusion, the universal one. The purpose of these writings is to illumine the road leading to eternal life by knowledge of the journey through illusion and back again to reality taken by man in his repeated adventures in time, space, and motion. In order to illumine the way, it is first necessary to trace the simulations, reflections, and illusions of the apparently many substances, forms, and things back to their base in the reality of the one thing. In attempting to do so, it has been possible in this one volume to touch the very fundamentals, but lightly, in order to correct existing misconcepts. Even though later volumes will consider the very many effects of motion in great detail, the basic principle of the one cause of the many effects will not be enlarged upon. It cannot be enlarged upon. This brief concluding chapter is written to draw from all that has heretofore been written the one lesson that all that man calls the created universe is but an illusion of the forms of ideals thought out by mind. Ideals and their expression in form have no existences whatsoever. They are unreal. They are but images conjured up by the image-making faculty of mind in the ecstasy of thinking. Their appearance of existence is due solely to motion and limited to the effects of motion. Increase motion in opposition and every effect of the illusion intensifies to its limitation in the simulation of non-motion and opposition of the universal white light of mind. Decrease motion in opposition, and every effect of the illusion nebulizes and eventually disappears into the white light of non-motion in inertia. Every ideal is constantly changing. Every effect of motion is constantly changing. Changing things can have no existence. On the contrary, all that man calls the undependable unreality of the unseen universe is in fact the only reality. Mind is the only real thing in the universe, and mind is all that is. Mind is the only substance in the universe. There is no other substance. Thinking mind is the only living thing in the universe. The thinking of mind is the life principle of the one substance. Thinking mind evolves ideals and registers them in form through motion. Man's physical universe of solids of matter is an aggregation of the forms of ideal thought out by mind and held in suspense for a time. If these premises are well founded, one can more intelligently answer the supreme question what is God? If there is but one substance, one being, one mind, one force, and that one is the only existing reality, must not that one be that which we term God? If all that which we know as form is but the changing illusion of the image-making faculty of thinking mind, then God must be formless and unchanging. If there is but one mind, and man is admittedly mind, then is not the form of man unreal and the real man formless. If the real man is formless, 
and the image of man is but an illusion of his thinking, is not that illusion of man self-creating? And is man not also God? And are not all things also God? Are not all things the one thing, thinking out the several ideas of the one real thing in the appearance of many unreal things? Is not that which we call heaven, but an image of man's thinking? If the statement herein made that form has no existence, and that nothing in this universe has time, place, or position, is in accord with the laws of motion herein formulated, then it must follow that man's heaven and hell must be illusions. If such places exist, they must be somewhere in the universe. They cannot be extraneous to it. If they exist within the universe, their existence must have dimension. If they are dimensionable, they must be subject to the laws of changing things. There is no part of the universe which enjoys the special privilege of immunity from the laws of gravitation and radiation. Man's heaven and hell are but illogical concepts of the outer mind. The inner mind rejects such unwholesome imaginings. They are traditions inherited from an age of superstition, of ignorance of nature's law, of fear, of belief in an avenging God, and of an attitude of mind which demanded the miraculous as a deific qualification. Man is self-creative, as all idea of mind is self-creative. That which we call self is but the changing form of ideal, thought out by the unchanging, formless one. Individuality, therefore, is non-existent except as it appears to exist in things of changing form. If individuality is only an effect of more or less sustained motion and ceases with cessation of motion, then individuality disappears with form at the passing point of absolute inertia in the cycle of motion. If individuality and form is an ideal only and sustained in the appearance of existence by the electromagnetic force of thinking, then that which man calls God cannot have form, nor can the attribute of individuality be attributed to him. God must be, can only be, universal. If God is universal, then all else is universal. If God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omnipotent, then all the universe is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omnipotent. When man learns that God is mind, that mind is the one living, pulsing, thinking force, and that he is that force, then man will have arrived at another stage in his evolution. When man learns that true thinking is an equilibrium of action and reaction, and that untrue thinking is unequal and opposed action and reaction, and when he further learns that he must suffer the consequences of his unequal actions by paying the penalty through the reaction in accordance with the absolute law from which there is no appeal to God or man, he will then think true. When man learns that all his thinking is electrochemically recorded, in the heavy master tones which constitute a record of the evolving ideal of his self-creating soul. And when he finds that a badly opposed record will keep him centuries behind more equally opposed ones, he will then have a thought as to the kind of a soul he is creating. When man learns that this universe of solid things is but a reflection of the ideas of those things, and that he is but a simulation of the ideal of himself, being thought out in entirety by himself, 
then he will know the ecstasy of inner thinking. Age and death are but sequel, sequences alternating with youth and life. These two opposing effects of motion are born together, but each travels a different direction along the wave of life. They pass each other at maturity when generation of one sequential life ends and its degeneration begins, only to meet again at the inertia plane of eternal life where degeneration ends and regeneration begins in another change of preponderance for another journey through time, space, and motion. There is no death. There is no darkness. There is only life in this universe of light. God is life. God is light. God is all that is. Just so long as man looks for the God force outside of nature and outside of himself, just so long as he bows in fear to the personal deity of his early inheritance, he will be the slave of his own imaginings. To know that the universal force is mind and that man and all else that is, is mind, is to inspire man with the ecstasy of inner thinking. The God force speaks to inspired man of inner thinking in the universal language of light, which all may understand when they but desire to understand. Few there have been, but countless numbers there will be, who will know the light of inner thinking. Guatemala, the Buddha, knew it faintly as Mohammed later knew it. Abraham dimly visioned it. Jacob knew the light less vaguely. The symbol of the Shinika was his ecstatic visioning. Moses knew the ecstasy of inner thinking in greater clarity. Abraham lived again in Jacob and in Moses and again in David. David and the prophets of his primitive day knew the light more clearly still and left a symbol of the seven lights so that others to come might know that they knew tonal laws of evolving and devolving things. David lived again in Jesus. Jesus the Nazarene knew the universal language of light in all its fullness. He knew the ecstasy of inner thinking as no man has ever known it. He knew the structure of the atom as no one before or since has known it. Jesus knew the universality of all things, the oneness of all things. He gave that knowledge to the then dull-witted, brutal, lustful, loveless world in his much-needed message of brotherly love. He lived again in John and Paul and Polontius and all those messengers who knew the light of universal thinking. In Jesus' day, man was not ready for the fullness of his mighty teachings. Man was still new. He was still in the ferment of his intellectual brewing, still searching for the avenging God of tradition to whom he could appeal for preferential rulings. Jesus gave to man the one great message of all time, he taught the universality of all things in the white light of the universal one of impartial love from whose rulings there is no appeal, but only a few could faintly understand. Today the world is ready and eagerly awaits the completion of his message. When Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now, he referred to his complete knowledge of the universal force. When he further promised, as recorded in the 16th chapter of John, that the Spirit of truth will again come to guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come, he prophesied the completion from time to time of his unfinished message as evolving man is able to bear, comprehend that message. The illumination of the Immaculate Light was complete in Jesus. Those messengers of the light who will complete his message to man 
will comprehend the fullness of his anointing in the light from his words. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Jesus gave to man sufficient unto his day and wisely withheld that which should be for another day. That which is herein translated from the light and that which is yet to come will be for the day of man now dawning. All who desire to know the light of universal thinking can know it when they can but com comprehend effects of cause sufficiently well to recollect from within their inner minds the light of cause. When that day comes to man, he will then know that everything that is must be of everything else that is. Nothing can be of itself alone. There can be no two of anything in the universe, two substances, two minds, or two beings. All things are universal. One. And then there's the diagram that shows the one in the center and it's a spiral. The creating universe appears from the one and disappears into the one. And this is something else he wrote. And now it is well to it and now it will be well to pause for a time in the ecstatic work of translating the immaculate light of universal thinking into words for which man has made no words, to the end that man may assimilate that which is here to in written down, and thus prepare himself for further revelations of the light. Consider well these words, for by knowledge of universal cause alone can man hope to comprehend universal effect. Faith and belief will in no wise open the doors of heaven to man. They but point out the path which leads to them. Through comprehension alone can man hope to know the language of light. And when that day comes to waiting man, then will he know that truth, beauty, and love in equilibrium are the very foundations of universal existence. I'll read that again. And when that day comes to waiting man, then he will know that truth, beauty, and love in equilibrium are the very foundations of universal existence. When he acquires the stability of perfect balance in his thinking, then will he be ready for the light and for the ecstasy of universal thinking in the knowledge of all things and for all power within universal limitations and for all presence in unity with the one. I read several of Walter Russell's books on my on my site. I think I, I ran out of pictures here. Back to library. Let me get some others going. Anyway, I read The Secret of Light. That's very good. I have a lot of views on that one. Also, I read The Universal One, which that was part of. And I must say the universal one was over my head because of the science that Walter Russell went into was not something I understood. But I had the feeling that what he was saying was correct. And I know that's not something to base anything on for a lot of people, but for me, I do. I had to base things on my feelings. And uh, also I read his books, The Divine Iliad One and The Divine Iliad Two, and a book by Clark, who wrote about Walter Russell, called The Man Who Tapped Into the Secrets of the Universe. Well, I've been getting pictures of this light and haven't seen it anywhere else. I've been hearing a lot of talk by quantum physicists and people who are looking for quarks and people who are talking about string theory and about light, how light has no mass. And when I'm filming this light, 
there's no mass. It's just something shiny that my camera focuses in on. And all this activity is in that shininess. And it is it exists in empty space, or what appears to be empty space, although I am concluding that space is not empty at all. It's filled with these kind of things, which from one talk I listened to, they were talking about the Higgs boson. And they were talking about how a lot of their equations depend on symmetry. And that symmetry is very important. And these pictures of these photons of light, they're not symmetrical. They're beautiful, even though they're not symmetrical. And what they were saying about antimatter made me think, could this be that? I really don't know. But when they speak of some of the, of the properties of what they're looking for, then I can identify with, well, this has no uh, property of physical mass, and yet there's dimension. You can see great dimension. And there's black holes. A lot of them have big black holes in them, these things. These, uh, I don't think any have gone by just now, but I do have several with black holes in them. And black substance that covers the orb sometime. And light entities that in, in the movies, I'm sorry, in the movies that I make, you can see the little bubbles moving about and another little character, which I call Harry, which is uh, a little light being. And you can just see the movement of light as a photon. And some mystical, see that's the black substance. See, you can see it right there. Sometimes a mass of black substance just will envelop one of these orbs. But there doesn't seem to be anything but sharing by these orbs with one another. They pass through one another and uh, they, they bleed out their colors into another orb or they become part of another orb. And if you're looking at one, you may be looking at a thousand because each little portion of these orbs can go out and be its own orb. And I think sometimes as I look at it that it looks like fabric. And some of the pictures I take, it folds like a thin veil and it twists and turns in ways that are, well, remarkable. I keep saying the word amazing, but I'm overusing that word. <laughs> but sometimes I, I see these, um, I see these orbs and people say, oh, those are not orbs, but they are. They have the little telltale line around them. You see around the outer edges, the little black concentric lines. All orbs seem to have that. Well, maybe not all, but the ones I'm, ca I'm catching pretty much all have it. Even when they lengthen out as a fan or as a long tube that looks real similar to a worm. And it moves and this light enters into its own self because sometimes I'll see it. It, it moved like a snake almost, and the head of it will enter into the, or well, the tail of it enters into the head of it. Like the snake that swallows its own tail. And this is light of so many colors. And they say color comes from us people and, and from our earth. And uh, all I know is this light, sometimes it turns real white and you can't see the colors until I put a little dark in the picture. The only adjustments I ever do to these pictures after I get them off my camera is I make the light less light and the dark a little darker. And that makes the colors emerge. And sometimes I just like to have it this running like a screensaver and just look at all these beautiful colors go by. I don't know the communication, how it communicates with me. I do know about the one little character I call Harry. Sometimes I say, Harry, where are you? 
and he appears, but he doesn't always. There are times I call for him and he doesn't come. But that's the only kind of communication I have with this light is with that one little character. Otherwise, I just look at it fascinated at what it will do next. And I've seen a lot of different things over time come into the light. Light carries little things within itself. And I think it's very responsive to the observer of the light. Let me go back to the library and I want to show you. Hmm. I want to show you the um, one called the ring. You see this one right here. I'll put it on play. This is a little photon of light that comes directly out of the light and it's sort of teardrop, teardrop shaped. Well, one day, this ring started coming in to in from the light in the teardrop shaped orbs. And I just watched and no day before had I ever got rings coming through in that portion of the light. That was the only day and since then I haven't gotten one again, but I do see the ring. It embeds itself in the bigger orbs that are further out. Let's see if I can come across one. No, that's the one as it's coming from the light there. But this is embedded in one of the bigger ones. And the ring, always when it was coming out of the light, it had a little solitary ring kind of floating right, I'm pointing to it right there, hovering right above it. And when I look at some of the uh, orbs that I get pictures of, I see that ring and that little solitary one that's hovering above it. I sort of see it in some of the ones where it's embedded itself. Now see, this is that ring right there. And there it is again. You can see the ring. It seems to be made up of little pebble-like lumps. There it is again. And I've seen it all strung out like a loop. It still makes a circle, but it has, a, it's loop-like. Maybe I'll see that one. I have so many pictures, it's hard to go to one particular one. That right there is Harry, the one I told you that is my friend in the light. I'll say, Harry, where are you? And he shows up. A lot of the times. I would say most times he does. But only with the old camera I have, not with the new one. My older camera captures things my new one won't capture. For instance, all these little rings. There's so many. The new camera gets a lot of rings, but not as many as the old camera. It seems that creation is done with circles, within circles, within circles. <laughs> There's that ring again. There's a little bit of hairy. Oops, that's the end of that one. And see how light moves. I watch it and this moves with my movement of my eyes or with the movement of the camera looking at it. I can make it go back into where it began from that one. And then I can make it move into a, this area, and that one just disappear out of sight. It moves so many ways, and it gets color in it. And I do believe, I believe, this is, an, uh, this is light that hasn't been seen this way before. I could be wrong, because I don't know about everything that scientific adventurers are doing right now. I did see an artist who did get a, a real colorful picture of orbs that look real similar to the ones I have. All day long I could take the, this picture of this big orb of light and every time it would have colors arranged differently somehow. I took a lot of pictures of that ring that day it came in. 
I was like amazed, like, what is this? I mean, everything inside the orbs is usually rings anyway, but this was just a particular big one and a dark one. I think something's going on with light, that things are coming in that will help us as a people to know more. Maybe light hasn't, it hasn't been that it could be seen this way before until now. I don't know. But I haven't gotten the attention of any scientific mind out there who wants to look into this. And it wouldn't take much, just a little digital camera and some object of glass. It doesn't have to be glass. It can be anything that shines. And a light. That's all you need to do this experiment. And I really wish other people would do it as well. You get some artwork. <laughs> Some of this is so beautiful and colorful. Like for instance, this one, I thought that would make a good splash of color to have a big picture of that on the wall. Or that one. Sometimes it looks like fire. Other times it looks like, like something like this that you don't know what anything in it is. Sometimes it looks watery. And there's a little mass of stuff that has a little color in it. But sometimes you get perfect round holes that are black. Look at that one. That's really weird. I'll go back to that one. That is a little uh, character that I see in my old camera, which is a artifact stuck in one place in that old camera because it always shows up in the picture in the same spot. But this is my new camera and it's got that character in it. So whatever's in my old camera shows up as a character of the light even with my new camera. And see this new camera catches a lot of circles too. And all this background that's fuzzy looking a lot of that looks circular-like. This is another of the artifacts that showed up with my new camera, and it's definitely definitive. It's, I call it the double-jointed artifact because it looks like it's got a, a joint here and one there. And this was taken with my new camera, but it's in my old one as a artifact. There it is again. When I saw it, I couldn't believe. I thought, wow, this is my new camera, and I'm getting that. I think someday Harry might show up in that one. This is with my old camera. I can tell because there's Harry. He always shows up. He just drops down into an orb, and there he is. Sometimes he gets beside two circles that I call the eyes of the orb, and they look like his eyes. When he's, when he's positions himself by them. I see that's a black circle. Just completely black and round. And this is the way they move. They stretch out like a book of light. And look at this one. It looks like a waterfall. And there, there's nothing symmetrical about them. I think that one's nice. They're very interesting. And you talk about um, light that is, what do you call, I'm trying to think of the word, entangled. So these orbs entangle themselves with one another all the time. And sometimes look at that one, it just It'll start out ribboning itself like a long ribbon or maybe like a long worm. But any part of the orb can bend and flex all kinds of ways like this one did here. And this is traveling and, and you can see its little light emanations as it travels. And it's picking up colors. And sometimes they're very holy. They're full of holes. This one's almost circus-like. It's like a, a big orb is coming down here, like a coming down the slide. And look at the color of that one. 
the green, purple, and pink all mingled together. This was the sky in a picture that I found on the internet. Someone said, uh, took a picture of it because it was so unusual looking. And I thought, my goodness, that looks like one of my orbs. <laughs> so I took this picture. There's another one. This is my most perfect black hole that I've ever captured in any orb was this one. And I thought, wow, what is it? And there's another black hole. That's a little character that's one of my artifacts. <clears throat> In my old camera, sometimes the orbs are pentagon shaped. And the colors, they change from second to second. From nanosecond to, nano, to nanosecond. Often, I snap a picture because I like the color real well. And before it snaps, because my camera isn't real fast at snapping, before it snaps, the color changes. And see how it looks like folds of fabric that just drape their self this way and that way? Sometimes I take my camera and just go right up into it. And you see, well, when you go up into it, you can see all the little tiny circles that are in it. Circles within circles within circles. Well, I'm getting at 36 minutes. I'm going to have to close. Before I do, I will take you into a real pretty colorful one. And I will end right here. And I will say, this is the Dove Lady over and out. Love to hear from any of you who wants to leave a comment or anyone who has an opinion of what they think I'm looking at. This is the Dove Lady over and out. Bye-bye.